So let me start off now by introducing Dr. Colin Barker. So Colin has been with us since 2012, and he, I think, has really uh, uh, you know, taken the lead in uh, you know, advancing structural heart interventions here, uh, along with uh, Neil Kleiman and uh, uh, Mike Reardon. Uh, Colin uh, did his internal medicine training in Nashville at Vanderbilt, and in fact, he and I overlapped a bit, so I think we did have a few patients in common. Uh, he went on to do his cardiology fellowship at NYU, and then did interventional cardiology training at Scripps Clinic uh, on the West Coast. And then he came to Houston here in 2012. So I think Colin has managed to hit all the coast as well as the south. We're very glad to have him here. And uh, he's going to give us a presentation on state-of-the-art management of mitral regurgitation. Colin, please come on up. Thank you. And uh, if you could explain to me what the MOC requirements are, I'd appreciate it. I still can't figure that out. <laughs> okay. The requirement um, is you send them a check. That's right. That's actually, it seems to be the only requirement. Um, well, thank you. I'm actually, uh, this is, we're going, we're going to the uh, case Bates format today, and it's, we're going to be focusing on mitral valve disease. So we have um, a panel that I'm sure hopefully won't be too shy about piping in as our fellows present some cases. So we have Dr. Gerald Lowry, our mitral surgeon expert, Dr. Neil Kleiman, our leader of interventional cardiology. Dr. Steve Little, our leader of the Valve Clinic and uh, Interventional Imaging, and Dr. Arvind Bimaraj, our leader in heart failure. And I think uh, it's important that you see we have quite a spectrum um, of different specialties and experts. And when it comes to mitral valve disease, I think it is so complicated. It requires input from a team uh, like we have here. So I want to thank our advanced fellows who will be presenting uh, the cases. We have Dr. Nadine Faza. Uh, Dr. Apurva Patel and Dr. John Neal, uh, who each, I think, have interesting cases. So I'll ask Nadine to come up first and present the case. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to start with the first mitral regurgitation case for this morning. All right. We have a 51-year-old female patient who presented to our valve clinic complaining of progressive dyspnea with exertion and signs of fluid overload. She had an extensive medical history. She had mitral valve replacement in 2015 with a 31-millimeter epic valve. She also had rheumatoid arthritis for which she was on immune suppressive therapy, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis requiring 24-hour oxygen at home, and she was undergoing evaluation for a lung transplant. The medical history was also notable for AFib and um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So when she came to Valve Clinic complaining of the shortness of breath, we immediately ordered an echocardiogram to assess the cardiac function and um, the function of her prosthetic valve. So these are the baseline TTE images. This is a parasternal lung axis view. You can see that the biprosthetic valve is well seated. If you look at the site of the leaflets, you can see something kind of prolapsing into the atrium. With application of color Doppler, you see some mitral regurgitation signal, but it's very hard to assess the severity based on the available values. <coughs> Her EF was normal. So we got more views to better assess the severity of her mitral, regurgita mitral regurgitation. And this is a two-chamber view. And again, you see a well-seated valve with some blood regurgitation in, regurgitating into the left atrium, but it's hard to assess the severity based on the views. The mean gradient across the valve was seven millimeters of mercury, but there were no other um, indices to suggest significant valvular obstruction. To better assess the bioprosthetic valve, we ordered a transesophageal echocardiogram to have better visualization of the bioprosthetic valve. And this is a four chamber view, and you can see the valve right here. It's opening well, but when it closes, you can see that something is kind of prolapsing back into the left atrium. A more zoomed-in view, and you see that the posterior part 
is prolapsing, even flailing back into the left atrium. And with the application of color, there's a very eccentric, anteriorly directed mitral regurgitation jet. Are we allowed to ask questions? Or you yeah, to and actually, Arvin, I wanted to ask you something first. She actually, she was being evaluated uh, next door for a lung transplant, and they were moving forward with that. Uh, and she came here basically for a second opinion with our lung doctors, and they heard a murmur, and that's what led to getting an echo and then referring her to us. But she had, the, the primary issue initially they thought was that it was pulmonary fibrosis, and they were sort of ignoring the mitral valve. So, I, I think one, yeah. <laughs> One comment in that regard is um, IPF means idiopathic. Whenever you hear the word idiopathic, we know we have no idea what the heck's going on. What that means is make sure you're not missing other things. And if you have a mitral valve problem or an aortic valve problem, we know they're always tough. In my mind, the moment she showed me that, I, I, I would have been very careful in making sure mitral uh, disease is, is ruled out. We've had a few cases in the past where they get referred for uh, IPF, and then we do the right heart cath, and the wedge is high, and then we start the escalation. It all turns out to be mitral valve disease, and they get better. Uh, and my other question for you is if you go back, and maybe the echo guys can comment. In your transthoracic echo, uh, would you have suspected something based on just by the uh, velocity of two on the inflow? Right, is that that's something subtle, but for a prosthetic valve, because it's been a while since I've read echoes, but my learning is if your inflow velocity or your inflow is very high, you could be missing a severe MR. Right? Is that something Absolutely. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um so we got Additional TE images are zoomed in view to the valve, and you can see that eccentric, anteriorly directed jet. And we interrogated the pulmonary veins. There was evidence of systolic flow reversal, which was consistent with severe mitral regurgitation. The patient had a cardiac CTA as part of the decision-making process to determine the best course of action. And the cardiac CTA did not show any evidence of coronary atherosclerosis. The biprosthetic valve was well seated with no evidence of dehiscence or paravalvular leak. And there was evidence of prolapse of one of the biprosthetic leaflets. As part of her lung transplant um, evaluation, she had a right heart cath about a month prior to presenting. And this shows us the significant V waves up to 40 millimeter of mercury and a mean wedge of 20. Very consistent with the picture. What would your decision be, and how would you treat this patient based on this magical number, STS score of 7.23%? Well, I'd like to say, uh, based on what Arvind told us about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, I'd like to see how uh, someone got that STS score. I don't have the exact calculations, but the STS score can, doesn't take into account all the factors that we talked about. So. I don't think it takes in uh, IPF wouldn't be on the score, would it? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's truly IPF, which it seems to be the topic of our discussion. But is, I don't think there is a, is there a box for that? No. So that's, that's the score, assuming not, not crediting her for IPF. No, no, I'm just asking, yeah. is that score calculated accurately? Do we know what her pulmonary function studies were? Just her regular PFTs? No, she had restrictive disease. They, those are part of her outside studies. But I mean, do we know how badly incapacitated she is on her pulmonary? Clinically, is she having trouble? I mean, I'm sure she's symptomatic, but has she got bad pulmonary function? I, I don't recall the pulmonary function, but she's on eight liters of oxygen 24 hours a day. So I, I was just going to comment on the, the, the imaging thus far. So we have a CT already done. I think probably realistically the this assessment of surgical risk was maybe done before the CT was done because really the CT you know, the strong indication for the CT if you're planning a valve and valve intervention. Um, you don't necessarily, we'll hear from the surgeon, uh, need the CT if you're gonna go to surgery, obviously. And uh, CT might be helpful, but I don't think it's critical, but it is critical if you're gonna do a, a valve and valve intervention. So probably the order of this presentation is she was clearly high risk for surgery, 
valve and valve was being considered, thus the CT. How big is the lady? She's not very big. So she's got a 7% predicted 30-day mortality mm -hmm. for mitral valve replacement. Yes, and this is uh, after what, we got what, what is her predicted mortality for lung transplantation? I'm not sure what this number is. Well, I don't know either, but you know, it you seems to me that if she's fairly off? high risk for open, sur open heart surgery, mm -hmm. her lung transplant risk is not going to be low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think they would do a lung transplant if there's a suspicion of a wedge-driven pathophysiology. No, no, but even if it were truly IPF, um, I would think this would scare the transplant surgeons. Do we, is there any further tests available to clarify what her lung diagnosis is, in fact? Because from a pure surgical point of view, this is a pretty <coughs> simple situation, actually. Yeah, so I don't know if they had a biopsy for the IPF diagnosis. And again, I think so they, can't, they get labeled based on CT changes, possibly. Mm -hmm. But I think to Dr. Laurie's point, the PFTs would be important to know to make a decision on whether surgery is a good option or not. From the lung transplant standpoint, it probably won't be a, even if she had a concomitant IPF and had mitral disease to a point of having a V wave of 40. And the only other comment with the right heart cath is sometimes with, if they have pulmonary, I didn't see a PA pressure, but if they have pulmonary hypertension, a V wave contamination can also be uh, not a true MR. Sometimes we see that. Uh, so with an MR, you could presume this is a V wave. But if the wedge is high, even if they had IPF, they would be worried of doing a transplant. Her mean pulmonary arterial pressure was 30 on that right heart cath. And uh, RV systolic function? The RV systolic function was uh, mildly reduced, and she had normal right-sided filling pressures on her right heart cath. She had always required some oxygen, but her requirements increased progressively over the past two months prior to presenting to us, which made us suspect that there was something more than just the IPF accounting for her symptoms. Dr. Laurie, any, any input on <clears throat> what happened to this valve? You know, it's three years old, two or three years old. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, we do not recommend uh, using tissue valves in the mitral position in young people. Uh, the uh, hemodynamics of the uh, mitral valve are quite different from the aortic. The peak load on the aortic prosthesis is 70 millimeters. The peak load on the mitral is, uh, is the systolic pressure, 120. And uh, the mitral valves typically are much larger. The average mitral, the average aortic bioprosthesis would be 21 or 23 millimeters. The average bioprosthesis in the mitral position is 27, 29. So you've got much bigger leaflets and a much higher load. And in a young person, this is a highly predictable scenario. And uh, the other highly predictable thing is that the people who put them in don't do their own reoperations. So I can tell you from personal experience that the reoperations are not particularly difficult, uh, but it's avoidable. And uh, these people should get mechanical valves. In the systemic diseases, we know in carcinoid disease it's been proven that the uh, bioprostheses in the tricuspid position are affected by the native disease. Uh, there's very little data on whether rheumatoid arthritis itself uh, will affect the uh, bioprostheses. Rheumatoid arthritis certainly is an etiology for mitral valve leaflet affliction, but uh, I've never come across a study showing any data uh, because very rare uh, rheumatoid uh, heart disease is pretty uncommon. Uh, it's more common to get coronary artery disease than it is to get uh, get rheum rheumatoid mitral disease. So, but I uh, this is a this is a to it's unfortunate. This is a totally preventable uh, scenario here, as far as the mitral is concerned. If the lungs were okay, the reoperation is is uh, ninety five percent of that risk number is lung related. I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, the surgical part should be a 1% to 2% risk procedure. It's got a huge left atrium. It makes it very easy, actually, to replace the valve. All right. <clears throat> so let's pull the, the panel as far as uh, treatment options. And, you know, uh, Ross and Marvin, feel free to chime in as well. So what are you guys thinking as far as treating this lady? Marvin, you want to transplant her lungs? No, I mean, definitely not. <laughs> I, I think that mitral valves probably contributing to a good extent. 
I mean, as Dr. Laurie said, if 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 actually if you optimize her, try to diurize her, and after load reduce her, and the lungs and oxygenation she gets off on, on just one liter or off of oxygen, you could consider a valve surgery that needs some inpatient optimization. Uh, if not, she's going to be yours. I'd say she's got severe symptomatic MR. Uh, there's concomitant lung disease probably, but so either way, the, the issue is the valve here. Um, it's a large valve, a 31, I think, which means you can get a large valve inside it in a valve and valve. Um, so I think you could probably put a sapient inside this and expect a mean gradient if things go well of four to five millimeters mercury, which would be okay. So um, having not laid eyes on her, I would think a valve and valve would be very reasonable. Neil. Yeah. I think the, the key is to really try to clarify her lung situation because at the age of 51, uh, uh, if she's got lungs that are actually okay, then uh, a valve in valve, she'll be back within a few years for another procedure, which actually probably won't be much worse because of the valve in valve. The valve in valve won't really affect the uh, subsequent open surgery, but uh, if the lungs turn out to be uh, secondarily affected primarily by the mitral valve, then I'd vote for uh, surgery. But if, until that's clarified, I'd have to reserve judgment. It, it, it might be difficult to uh, determine whether the lungs are due to pulmonary edema or due to IPF with pulmonary edema on top and, until you clear the pulmonary edema. And that may not be able, may not be possible until you fix the valve. And so, uh, absolutely, if you can show that it's pulmonary edema, she would benefit from a, an open uh, MVR, uh, probably consider a mechanical valve. If she does have true IPF that's heading towards a lung transplant, uh, then that may uh, make things a little trickier with a, with a mechanical valve, and you may consider doing a TAVR valve and valve at that point, and that could even help you to clarify the IPF question uh, do the TAVR valve and valve, get her to recover, do a lung biopsy and see if uh, if the pulmonary edema doesn't clear, if the x-rays still look like she has uh, interstitial lung disease, then uh, a lung biopsy may uh, tell you if you truly have uh, IPF or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I like the the pulmonary issue is, is sort of the variable here um, that would drive you one way or the other. Um, and I agree, I would... If, if there was someone willing to do, you know, an open redo with a mechanical valve, that's her best option, I think, long term. Uh, and, but in the short term, I think a valve and valve is a reasonable alternative, knowing that the durability is, is and, you know, having full disclosure and, and, you know, at least laying out the expectations that the durability is, is unknown and, and definitely not going to be the same as a mechanical valve. But it does give you an option, as Ross points out, to sort of clear up the lung picture. You take the MR out of the equation, um, and then you can really uh, hammer down what's going on with the lungs. I think from a hemodynamics standpoint, this may also be a case, if there is any doubt, of doing a transeptal and, and you know, getting real measurements of the left atrium, um, which, is, which is fairly uh, benign and can, be, and can be useful. So Nadine, what happened? So we decided to proceed with a valve in valve in the mitral position. And I just want to highlight this application, which, can, which you can all download. There's one for the mitral, one for the aortic. So this patient had an epic 31 millimeter valve. You can use the transcatheter heart valve selector, and you can get the compatible devices that can be used for this valve and valve procedure. In our case, we used the Sapien 3. So the patient was taken to the hybrid OR. A transeptal puncture was performed under 2D and 3D echocardiographic guidance. Then the delivery system was um, advanced into the left atrium. And on the second image, you can see the balloon. And these are fluoroscopic images demonstrating uh, the deployment of the Sapien 3 valve in the uh, mitral position. The balloon being inflated, the valve being deployed, and the rapid pacing here. Something you may not appreciate that's very helpful here. Whoever put this valve in used these um, Cornot sutures, which are those uh, sort of self-tying knots, and they're radio opaque, so you get a, a nice landing zone uh, visual there. 
You can also see this under 3D um, echocardiogra echocardiography. The first picture is the balloon being inflated. Second picture demonstrates the valve being deployed, and then the balloon being deflated. What was the discussion of uh, durability of the valve in the office before the operation? Unknown, but <clears throat> at least hopefully a couple years. Uh, and I think that's an honest, you know, I think it is unknown. And these are the post-deployment TTE images demonstrating a well-seated valve with minimal uh, mitral regurgitation. Again, with 3D and 3D um, color Doppler, there's minimal central mitral regurgitation. The ventricular gram, again, demonstrating no significant MR. Ended up with an iatrogenic ASD, but that was mainly left I would love to write chunting, so we did not have to close it. She came back to our valve clinic, had a transthoracic echocardiogram. The valve appeared well seated, no evidence of a mitral regurg regurgitation or valvular obstruction. The mean gradient was within an acceptable range of four millimeters of mercury, did not have any pericardial effusions, no evidence of LVOT obstruction, which is more of a concern when you do um, a valve in native valve versus a valve in a biprosthetic valve. She was doing better, and she was requiring less oxygen. She was going to follow up with her lung doctors. Good. Thank you. So let's, uh, you want to do the next case? It's up to you. Go ahead and do it. It'll... <laughs> this is quick. OK. This is a short case. So this is a six-year-old uh, gentleman who presented to our valve clinic with acute, who was admitted actually with acute onset dyspnea on exertion. He was two months status post mitral clip implantation at A2P2 and A2P3. After his mitral clip procedure, he felt great, did not have any shortness of breath. I was able to um, do his normal activities, and then suddenly one day he started having severe shortness of breath with minimal exertion. I'm going to show the clips from um, right after he got the mitral clip uh, procedure. So you can see the two clips here with minimal MR. This is before the end of the procedure. And this is the 3D image. Um, it's not very clear, but oh. you see the two clips here, A2P3 and A2P2, with minimal MR on the TTE. So after he presented with these <coughs> symptoms, we decided to do another transesophageal echocardiogram to check on his mitral regurgitation and, and valvular function and clips. And what do you see here? So this clip, which was the more lateral one, had detached from the posterior leaflet. <coughs> So the more medial one was still there, creating a tissue bridge, while the more lateral one had detached and was only attached to the anterior <coughs> leaflet, leading to severe <coughs> mitral regurgitation. So the patient basically presented with single leaflet detachment of the uh, um, I'm mitral sorry, clip. What? <laughs> single leaflet detachment. Well, actually, the technical name for that is more optimistic. It's called single leaflet attachment. attachment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, Honestly, we, we call I it, like that. Uh, I like that more actually. Uh, it was I mean, only it's attached glass half to the empty or half full. The, the correct normal. name is actually clip slip. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the truth, but really, it's called SLA, not SLD. <laughs> All right, so it was. <laughs> no. Single leaflet attachment clip slip case. Um, we know that the patient is high risk. That's how he qualified for mitral clip in the first place. Had a high STS score and had history of cabbage in the past and COPD requiring oxygen. So with him being this symptomatic with severe MR and known single leaflet attachment, well, um, uh, how would you treat Let me ask uh, Dr. Laurie for a second. What, once the clip's in place, what's the likelihood of being able to repair this valve? Uh, single clip placement has a pretty good track record. The area involved is small enough. You can actually either dissect it off, which is hard, or just resect it and put a little pericardial patch. There is a significant literature in this, particularly from Europe and particularly from Germany, showing that two clips up, once you get to a second clip, it drops to about 20, 30% repairability, and three clips up, there's no repairability. 
but one clip there is some chance, but uh, even one clip it, uh, in the course of the procedure there can be enough trauma. You don't see it on the echo, but if you open, in the early days when we were actually the surgical arm for Herman, going back a long way, these atria would be absolutely lacerated from, from three hours of manipulation and the mitral valves would be lacerated too. But I think these days, just the, a nice clean application of one clip, the probability is pretty high that it could be a repair later. All right. So based on the clinical scenario, we decided to just clip it again. So th this is I mean, usually, historically, a fairly rare event. I mean, like 0.6%. Um, but we've seen a little uptick recently with, with the newer generation of, of clips. Um, and, it, and it probably is a, uh, ultimately a technique issue where you need to get really a lot of tissue uh, to secure in there to make sure it doesn't come loose. Mm -hmm. So the patient was taken to the cath lab. Again, transeptal puncture under 2D and 3D TE guidance, passing the delivery system through the transeptal puncture site. And then fluoro, you can see evidence of the single leaflet attached. Yeah, the one uh, clearly flop. It, they, they should be very stable on fluoro, and you can see that one really flopping around. And, and you know, that's a you're lucky it's not flying somewhere else. Um, we, we did have years ago, I don't know if you remember one that embolized right into the right coronary artery. Then we um, advanced the third mitral clip. We placed it just lateral to the, to the detached clip. We ended up with a triple orifice mitral valve with mild MR. The patient felt better. We started with systolic reversal in the pulmonary veins and ended up with a, an upright S-wave in the pulmonary venous flow consistent with a reduction in the LA pressures. And the forward flow across the LVOT increased. Um, also to support the reduction in mitral regurgitation. With direct LA, pres LA pressure monitoring, the pressure dropped from 58 to 16, and the patient felt much better after the procedure. We followed them up in clinic. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's a quick uh, question, Paula. <clears throat> so you, you leave the unstable clip in there and mm -hmm. hope it doesn't embolize. Exactly. I mean, uh, <laughs> we hope a lot of things in the cath lab, but I think um, the, one thing you, we didn't show you is on the fluoro, once that third clip went in, that, that floppy one isn't flopping anymore. It was, it was much more stable. Um, and when we told the patient, you know, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Hopefully this stays where it is. Um, it is more secure. Um, but we'll see, and we're following him a little closer than everyone else. You know, we usually see him 30 days in a year, but him we're kind of checking in every three months. The one technical thing that's interesting in this case is that the clip that it detached from one, one of the leaflets is actually the first clip that went in, because we look back at that. So you'd think when the second clip goes into the procedure, the first clip often obstructs the imaging and makes the, the confidence in the, lift, in the tissue grab and things like that more difficult because there's more artifact material. But in this case, the original clip is the one that actually came off, not the second clip, which is usually the fear. Yeah, and just conceptually, Arvind, if, uh, if there's single leaflet attachment, there's, there may be more stress on the leaflet, but there's less stress on the clip because the leaflets are not trying to pry it off. That's true. Great. All right, so uh, thank you, Nadine. So, John Neal, our interventional fellow, he has the next case. All right, so our next case, um, we had a 60-year-old white male, past medical history of atrial fibrillation and severe mitral regurgitation, second to Barlow's disease, um, and additionally had a flail P2 segment initially, um, and was status post repair several years ago with a 37 millimeter tune ring and, and um, Neocords. He also had an, uh, underwent a maze procedure at the same time. Um, and he did well for a number of years until about six months ago when he began noticing that um, he was quite short of breath when climbing st stairs or carrying any heavy objects. Um, of note, he was still relatively active, um, swimming uh, several times a week, but just felt like he couldn't do as much as he had previously um, and made a big difference in his lifestyle. Um, on exam, 
relatively euvolemic. Uh, vital signs were within normal limits, um, mostly notable for a holosystolic murmur at the apex. Um, but like I said, relatively euvolemic, <coughs> stable, well appearing, uh, healthy looking 60 year old gentleman. Um, so ultimately, he underwent or was sent to us with the TE already done. So I'll share those images with you. Here on an X plane image, you can see um, pretty significant prolapse and also likely some. Uh, flail tissue back into the left atrium. Um, and again, from a different angle, showing similar uh, prolapse. And a very eccentric color jet that, uh, in spite of their best efforts, was a little bit hard to fully capture on, on even on TE images. From the surface echo, I'll just tell you it was very difficult to recognize the severity. Um, but on TE pulmonary vein interrogation, you can see clear systolic flow reversal indicating uh, it's very hemodynamically significant. And on 3D, you can, this is not in Dr. Little's favored orientation, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't take the blame for this one since he came with the study from elsewhere. <laughs> um, but you can see some clearly uh, flailing portions of the posterior leaflet, which in this particular case is on the top, uh, mostly in the P2 segment, but a little bit as well in the P3 segment. I think it's interesting to see the flexible ring still flexible many years post up. We often hear questions about whether these flexible rings are worthwhile because they might lose their flexibility. And you can see here how flexible that ring is there. And this is, I mean, I think over 10 years old or something. So Dr. Laurie, what's, what's the mechanism of the recurrent regurgitation usually, and, and what would be the repair here? Uh, obviously, you don't have to put in another ring. Would this be a simpler operation, or? Uh, yes. Uh, we've got a, um, out of uh, two 2,100 repairs, uh, We've got about 40 uh, reoperations, and of those reoperations, 90% have been re repaired. And typically, we go in and we take off the old ring, we take off everything, and then start from scratch. And uh, both the, the ring dimension and the caudal dimension uh, are very important. Uh, as we've done more and more work on strain, we've now got a a, a factory doing strain measurements. We've, we've been able to industrialize strain measurements from one a week to like one an hour now. So we're, everyone's getting strain measurements on their leaflets. <coughs> and it's become apparent that the strain on these leaflets is very high. And where we used to use two or four cordy, we're using six, eight, and 10 cordy. We did a patient yesterday with a huge uh, uh, P2 prolapse and a, two, a huge anterior leaflet prolapse. And we've got 10 cordy on his anterior leaflet. So we're trying very hard to uh, distribute strain. And in our current cohort, we've just uh, finished running to submit uh, in a thousand patients with 10 years follow up. We're down to a 3% recurrence rate now. So this is becoming uncommon, but the Barlow's people actually, uh, contrary to what you might think, given the extent of the, the uh, pathology, have done equally well as everyone else. All our anterior leaflets, posterior leaflets, and Barlow's have identical 10 year uh, durability. So uh, when we look back on these kind of cases, we now feel that in our ignorance, um, we could have, we now do a better operation and these things are less likely to occur. But the likeliest mechanism here at this very late date is uh, an incompletely engineered repair that's left some residual strain somewhere and over time the native disease has led to a failure. In uh, January of 2018, in I think Jack Imaging, we had a little a letter to the editor uh, documenting for the first time that our new techniques have reduced the strain on the leaflets to below that of normal patients. So this is, we're really excited about it. We think this is gonna be a big contributor to, to the high durability. The Thank question. You. Get a mic. Thank 
Given that this is the, in uh, Barlow syndrome, can you hear me? Yeah, it's uh, given that in Barlow syndrome that this is a ground substance problem, uh, w once you repair the leaflets, don't you expect uh, that you will continue to have some degeneration of the leaflets? Uh, and it really depends uh, in the uh, biological life cycle of the leaflets when you repair them as to how durable the repair will be. If you repair them early, uh, you might not be as durable as if you repair them late. And uh, you would expect that by the time they get to you, they're mostly late. Uh, well, Can you comment is, uh, on all that? This is the insight our group had here, which is, I think, unique. I think we're alone in the world right now. Uh, if you get some architect's drawings to build a high rise, and all the specifications of the steel beams, and you find you're in an environment where you've only got wood beams available, then obviously if you put wood beams in there, you're not going to have a very durable building. On the other hand, there are many buildings in England and Europe that are a thousand years old built out of wood because they were designed to work with wood. So we started looking at the repair techniques. The Carpentier repair technique leaves people with very high stress and strain on their leaflets, and 30% of them come apart over time. So we went back and started looking at the engineering with the University of Houston and these strain measurements of our TE tapes and uh, came up with a variety of maneuvers, one of which is using more cordy, uh, ensuring annular durability because the heart is trying to push these leaflets together itself. And we've come up with a technique that produces these very low strain levels, which we think fall within the performance characteristics of severely degenerated leaflets. And therefore, we expect these leaflets to last indefinitely, even though they're very severely diseased. So in spite of the fact that there is progression in ground substance, uh, the repair is such and it happens late enough so that uh, uh, it's durable. Yes, correct. <laughs> Colin and uh, Steve, perhaps. Given that right now you're doing the mitral clips in high-risk patients for the uh, FMR, are you looking at the same strain on the leaflets, and does that help predict? Given that your strain seems to be a factor in causing potential dysfunction, would that be something you would follow up in your patients to see if the outcome can be predicted? Well, I think it's a great uh, academic question because we'd love to know, you know what this does to leaflet strain. Um, practically, we don't need to do that right now because the clip is only indicated when surgery is not possible. I think, I think as the device and the technology moves probably into the lower risk group, you know, as Chaver did, if it moves into intermediate, then we have to make a choice between surgery uh, and clip. Then a prediction of strain and durability would probably become much more important. Um, in today, it's you know we know that the clip is better than Lasix. Um, so <laughs> that, that tends to be the algorithm. So, and we know that in fact we're creating probably a very, very high strain state because it's completely, you know, uh, abnormal to have this tissue bridge. Uh, but as it fibrosis and becomes scarred down, it's sort of, you know, self um, protecting against a rupture per se. But then, though, it's a leaflet intervention, not a portal intervention. <laughs> but we're probably creating a very high strain state. Let, let me add yeah, something. I think this. Uh, it, if you looked at the, if you recall the pictures of the uh, mitroclip patients acutely and chronically, uh, there is a real bridge that widens and joins the anterior and posterior annulus. And in fact, this becomes so strong that it almost starts to function as a partial annuloplasty. And it's probably that the leaflets are under strain, but over time, it's possible there may be a little less strain and certainly not progression of strain because of this really marked fibros fibrous joining of the anterior and posterior leaflets and the filling in where the leaflets go down, that whole thing fills in with this bridge that's often <coughs> four or five millimeters wide. Thank you. Can I add something? Nice discussion about strain, but uh, it's very nice from our collaboration with the University of Houston, I think with the work of Carlos, where's Carlos? Dr. El Talawi here, we have the largest series really of looking at strain. And to your question, actually functional mitral regurgitation or secondary mitral regurgitation, strain on the valve is normal. 
So it tells you that although the valve is larger and the, the annulus is larger, and these are data we presented at the American Heart Association, hopefully it will be submitted soon for publication, is that most likely strain also depends on the properties of the mitral valve itself. So degenerative or primary disease has the highest strain. Functional or secondary mitral regurgitation, since the leaflets are normal, strain is actually rather normal. Now you could say well, the pressure is a little lower actually in these pa patients, the same pressure was there. So it's not higher, much higher strain for the secondary mitral regurgitation. The degenerative myxomatous Barlow disease, no question about it. They're thicker, their properties are different, and by reducing, at least the pilot data, by reducing you know, the annulus as well as putting in you know, cordae, artificial cordae, you reduce that strain, most likely because you also you're reducing the exposure of that mitral valve, which is much larger. Thank you. Good. Any other comments? And then we'll, let's pull the panel. Um, or John, is there any other images you want to show, or can we? Uh... Uh, just note that on um, MR, as we kind of already noted, the regurgitation was pretty severe, 94 mils of regurgitant volume, 60% fraction, um, and the pathology is kind of what we saw on TE. I didn't actually pull the images. They weren't, didn't add a whole lot, but. All right. Arvin? In this particular case, <laughs> Dr. Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> MR is very useful. <laughs> Lasix and Entresto? Yeah, Lasix still works, so I don't agree <laughs> with Steve. You'll need Lasix even after the mitral valve. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's no doubt about the, I mean, the MR, uh, I don't know what toys you guys have, but it's a 61-year-old, I think operating him on him and giving a durable option might be the first choice. Yeah, I mean, the options are kind of always the same. There's the option to, you know, medical therapy only if they don't want an intervention. There's the option for a surgical redo if the patient's uh, deemed at a reasonable operative risk. And then there's the option for a, a catheter intervention. The catheter interventions are either a valve and ring, as we saw in the first case, and you can do that. Um, elevated risk because this is a valve and a, and a ring, which still has a complete anterior leaflet. So the anterior leaflet uh, being displaced into the LVOT becomes a more practical problem. Um, and the other interventional option is a mitral clip, and we've done more than a dozen of mitral clips in these scenarios, provided that the surgeon uh, left the posterior leaflet, which not all surgeons do, but um, you know the, the posterior leaflet is there and can be grasped, and a mitral clip's an option. And I, uh, with the posterior leaflet's still here on this one, right? It is, yes, sir. Yeah. So I, I would vote for clip as the lowest morbidity procedure. Uh, one. Uh, we do have some patients who have come back with severe MR who are totally asymptomatic. I mean, we've done MRI to document that the MR is severe and uh, who have remained asymptomatic with no change in the left ventricular function for years. Uh, so there is a subgroup of these people, and I think, uh, I mean, this is a group that needs to be looked at at some point, but the presence of an intact good <laughs> <laughs> uh, prosthetic ring that prevents annular dilatation, I think, has some impact on the progression of left ventricular dysfunction in people with mitral regurgitation. And uh, so this is a subgroup. Uh, so when we see these people and they're asymptomatic and their LV dimensions, like their end systolic dimensions, three or three and a half, uh, we're prone to follow them every six months. And uh, some of them we've followed for quite a while. Some of them obviously. Uh, show up with symptoms and they just need another operation. If they're in good health, we just recommend another operation. And they're younger. And the older ones who are in good health but who are in their 70s and maybe we've operated on them seven or eight years before, I think MitraClip is an ideal therapy because they already have a very good uh, annuloplasty in place and the other cordy are usually not what's uh, disrupted. This is usually a disruption of some other native cordy. <coughs> So I think uh, we have this little series we've been working on, and uh, we've been very pleased with the early results of MitraClip for localized uh, flail segments that have appeared years after the original surgery. Yeah, remember, this guy, according to what you've told us, is pretty symptomatic. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah, and so uh, the, the posterior leaflet is, is, is a big issue if you're going to think about a MitraClip. The other issue, as we encountered um, yesterday, 
is as long as someone doesn't put in a, a ring that's too small. Um, you know, the, the risk of a, you know, as Neil pointed out, the procedure is very safe. Um, the issue is always the effectiveness, you know, how much MR you leave, and how much residual MR, but also how much um, diastolic gradient uh, are you creating. We had a case yesterday with someone who had a 27-millimeter uh, ring with severe MR, and as soon as we put one little clip in, there was a 15-millimeter diastolic gradient. Clearly, that's not tolerable. Um, you know, in this case, they, I think, had a large ring, um, so, so I think, you know, if, if surgery is considered and, it, and it's deemed um, high risk or for whatever reason not a good option, then I think a clip would be reasonable. Um, I will say that I guess in his initial repair he did have eight neocords, so there was some concern that it likely would not be repairable the second time around. Um, and from an interventional standpoint, there was some concern about as large as the flail width was, it might be a challenging clip. Um, I didn't know if y'all had any comments on that. I mean, I showed you very limited images, but. I think one thing is, is hard, it's, it, it's very hard to predict how, the, how it's gonna respond. So we sort of have to just go in there and do the procedure. And, and one of the luxuries, as you know, we have is if it doesn't work or we don't like it, we just take it out. I'll just comment, the cords don't necessarily impact the imaging during the procedure, the, but the ring certainly does. It's, uh, it's often a blind grab of the posterior leaflet. You, you have to know that it's there. You might see it in some images, uh, but usually in the action shot where you're trying to grab the leaflet is exactly where the ring creates an ultrasound shadow. So it's, you get a nice, beautiful bite of the anterior leaflet and a grasp of faith on the posterior leaflet, and you only know you've got it when the MR goes away. That's the reality. Uh, Colin. Uh I don't, I mean, I don't know if you have a summary at the end about what is classic indications or how eclectic are these interventions and what's FDA approved. If not, it might help. A couple comments on is mitral valve prolapse FDA approved for the clips or is it just degenerative? And then the valve and valve also, right? It's not what is approved and what is not. So the overall, you know, heart team assessment, including a surgeon, interventional cardiologist, and a uh, non invasive person. Uh, deem they have degenerative mitral valve disease um, and they're high risk for surgery. Initially, they, the high risk was defined as greater than an STS greater than 8% for a repair. Um, and that still remains the indication today. Well, originally it was inoperable, wasn't it? Uh, Prohibitive. Well, Prohibitive. Prohibitive operative risk is determined yet. Which is a moving bar. Yeah. Okay. So after again heart team discussion, uh, there was again concern that this would be a very challenging re repair, um, and that prior to proceeding with replacement, it was worth giving a shot to to a mitral clip procedure. Um, here you see a, another image of in the more favored orientation. Um, of similar pathology as seen before. Um, again, the very eccentric jet noted uh, jetting anteriorly with a large flow convergence. Um, here's transeptal puncture, clip being positioned um, over the A2P2 area um, and result after the first clip. Um, again, you note there's still Pretty large amount of residual MR, although improved after the one clip <coughs> placement. Um, so, given, like we talked about, that there's some limitation as far as how many clips you can put in, especially with the ring, um, as far as how much gradient you can cause, uh, after one clip, the gradient was four. It was felt with that much MR, at least part of this was flow mediated. Um, so, a decision was made to go ahead and proceed with a second clip. Um, and given that the jet was mostly anterior, you can see here the clip, initial clip here, and the second clip being placed medial to the first clip. And after positioning and grasping, you can see a, a improved result as far as residual MR. Um, gradient actually stayed about the same or even a little bit lower with uh, less flow through the valve after reduction of the regurgitation, which we see relatively frequently, I'd say, 
um, just because so much. You got two it. gradients there that are pretty different. So yeah. I'm just I'm just going to comment on that for the for the Echo folks. And this is a common scenario uh, when you Doppler one of these small, you know, sort of iatrogenic orifices that have been created. You get this double shadow on the Doppler. And if you trace the dense, smaller one, you get a mean gradient of two. If you chase the sort of the less dense, larger one, you get a mean gradient of six. Um, it's hard to know. Um, those aren't necessarily that different in terms of decision making here, but sometimes it's the difference between five and seven or five and eight, and that will actually impact what you do with the clip. Um, so early days when we first encountered this a few times, we dropped, Dr. Barker dropped a pigtail across the valve and saw that generally the mean gradient by catheter is actually right between the two. So the mean gradient really is probably four in this case. Which well, uh, we, we learned a long time intraoperatively that hard negotiation can generally knock three to four millimeters <laughs> off a, a mean gradient <laughs> post-op. So uh, well, there's yeah. always a negotiation That's phase right. after the <laughs> post-op echo is done. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the, the larger area I think was five. I didn't include it here, but um, so probably mean gradient somewhere in the three to four range, similar to the other prior after the first clip. And here you see um, two very medial clips in the A2P2 area with uh, double orifice and probably a small orifice there that is not visualized here. Um, and patient did well. We have seen, recently seen back in clinic at one year follow-up and um, has basically been able to go back to his prior lifestyle um, with basically class one symptoms, doing very well. So, um, so far it's worked out well for him. Yeah, I think the, uh, I mean, based on the, the <coughs> excellent long-term durability of the mitra clip, and uh, this man's got eight cord in, probably uh, another area is given uh, away, uh, and the durability of the surgical repair, this is an, an ideal way of dealing uh, with this situation. I'd, I'd expect this person would have a very long-term durable uh, correction from this really minimal thing compared with a redo surgery. Great. Thanks, John. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to have a perva come up and just run through this case in two minutes because this is an active case. And Arvin, you'll be on the spot here primarily uh, is what should be the therapy here. Lasix. <laughs> uh, so quickly, we have an 84-year-old gentleman who has baseline NYHA three symptoms presented to the hospital with acute heart failure de um, decompensation, has non-ischemic cardiomyopathy EF of 20% with a bi ICD, uh, multiple heart failure hospitalizations in the past year, uh, has a baseline kidney function creatinine of uh, two uh, with recurrent VT. He, was, he presented to an outside hospital this month, actually, uh, with uh, uh, symptoms at rest requiring oxygen and lower extremity edema. He underwent a right heart cath and at that time uh, had borderline high filling pressures with a cardiac index of 1.2. And then he was transferred to us uh, on IV diuretics uh, and uh, IV dobutamine for further advanced care. Uh, on exam has JVD, uh, uh, pansystolic murmur and lower extremity edema. Uh, BNP on presentation is 515, uh, creatinine is 2.3 and a troponin of 0.4. So he was optimized uh, uh, during his hospitalization stay on IV diuretics, uh, weaned off the dobutamine, um, and maintained on, on a beta blocker, hydralazine isosorbide, uh, aldactone, torsamide, and he takes amiodarone uh, for his uh, VT. Uh, it's not on an ACE inhibitor or an ARNI because of his creatinine function. Uh, this is his uh, EKG, which shows uh, biventricular pacing still has a pretty much uh, wide QRS at 180. Uh, this were his right heart numbers after optimization, uh, which shows a mean PA pressure of 26, a wedge of 18 with a V wave of 26, and a cardiac index of 2.6. His PA sats were 70 uh, after optimization. So uh, this, uh, this is his 2D echocardiogram that was done after he was uh, optimized. And as you see, he has a severely reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, with a borderline high LV dimension. His end diastolic dimension was 5.3. Uh, and as you see, he does have some thickened leaflets, 
with uh, restricted mobility of the posterior uh, leaflet uh, that you see on the four chamber view here. However, there is uh, no echinesis of the uh, lateral wall. And as a result of this uh, dilated LV and this restricted mobility, he has uh, severe MR, which was mainly eccentric uh, towards the posterior wall. And this is probably one of our most common consults, frankly. Um, and it's, it's still a challenge. I forget, how symptomatic is he now? So right now he's still, um, with minimal exertion, he has symptoms, so NYHA 203. And how old is he? 84. And this echo was after optimization? This was after the right heart cath was done. Hmm. So let me ask you. <laughs> So I'll ask a simpler question. So pretend there's no MR, an 84-year-old with an EF of 20% and some diabetes. What's, what's his mortality? Very high. Anybody know? I don't know. I don't know. Probably I don't know, know the exact uh, number. I mean, you're 50% two year, something like that? But I think you have to do a multivariate with a Seattle heart failure and be a little more objective. But uh, I think if you do a univariate point, 20% EF is not, not that good. An index of 1.2 is not good. Um, but if for a true outcome, you have to do a Seattle heart failure score because a lot of other variables go into it, like BUN, creatinine. The way, the way I'm sort of looking at these people now, and we've discussed this in uh, the research conference, is, is this a co-apt person or is this a mitra FR person? Yeah, um, this is a France person. <laughs> that's the question. Um, and in this case, I honestly don't know. He's sort of somewhere in between. I mean, maybe a little bit more towards towards uh, MITRE FR, though. Yeah, I mean, this guy's ejection fraction would have excluded him from, uh, from co-apt. Yeah. You have an really object... 20% his ejection fraction? It's down there. Yeah, and it's, it 20, 30. If he didn't yeah. have the MR. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that, that's another important aspect to remember, right? Your MR overestimates your EF, so it's probably worse than that. And do you have an objective... Like ERO and those documentation? No, we do not have that. Because I, I think, and I don't know if you'll cover it, to what Colin was saying, between COAPT and MITRA FR, the patient selection was key. Right? One was a successful trial, another was a not successful trial. The ERO was different. It was 40 versus 30. The optimization was different. There was a stricter optimization with a heart failure cardiologist, with the surgeon and everybody for the co-op trial. So if he gets optimized and his ERO remains high, uh, depending on his symptoms, again, two and three were the most represented in the co-op trial. So if he remains class three and his ERO is what co op had, I think you could consider for the long term a mitral clip on him. What's the long term? I mean, he's 84, none of the there trials is. have him, so you don't know anything about him. So, you know, that's always the caveat. Yeah. Just as a, a general comment on ejection fraction, uh, just day in, day out, EF down to 30%, uh, mitral valve repair really is pretty low risk, regardless of the etiology. Uh, between 20 and 30%, you have to be very careful, do a good workup, check on the right ventricle, uh, and once you hit 20%, uh, it's very rare these people are going to do well with uh, any kind of surgical mitral valve intervention. And we, at that point, we generally get our uh, heart failure people to see the patient. Yeah, you know, in fact, in COAPT, which uh, required an EF, uh, as I recall, the cutoff was down to 30%, mitral clip was very safe. So complications were really negligible. In mitra FR, which allowed patients with substantially larger end systolic volumes and uh, it, ejection fractions that were considerably lower, so it's a different population. Uh, the CLIP procedure wasn't so safe. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, those guys weren't very good at putting in CLIPs. But the other side of that coin is uh, they were putting them in much sicker patients, mm. or in what appear to be much sicker patients. Yeah, so I, th I think wrapping up here, it's interesting, Arvin, you said CLIP, because I think Steve, Neil, and I would actually say no clip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, no surgery. And, and I think, yeah, Dr. Laurie says no surgery. I mean, I think this is someone we would these days probably be very, be, be reluctant uh, to do anything on.
Yeah, I, mean, I think to your point, it, you know, the verdict's not out with the two trials showing one negative, one positive. Um, but if he stabilizes and he's not short of breath, then there's no reason to treat it. I think you know your your hospitalization and quality of life was probably the primary driver. Mm -hmm. So I, if at at we a wedge of 18 and a V wave of 26, sometimes it's actually not bad. They're functional enough. So I would continue to optimize that part. Great. All right. Thank you our, to our presenters and thank you to our panel.